and the three key things that we looked at was what was the role of rumours. And one of the things that I think for me anyway coming um, here today has been incredibly valuable to hear the value of reliable information in a crisis situation. Um, and rumours can, you know, can, can have a really uh, detrimental effect in, in kind of keeping operations um, running smoothly. So the role of rumours was a big one. Um, finding evidence for incitement was a big one. Because incitement, people were obviously getting arrested um, for incitement on Facebook. So we were interested in seeing, did the same happen on Twitter? Were people using Twitter to incite? Um, and at the time, of course, there was a misunderstanding um, of the role of Twitter, the role of Facebook, and the role of VBM. And what became clear quite quickly, of course, is that VBM played a, a very different role to Facebook and Twitter, but they were still being grouped together um, as sort of to blame. And then we looked at the role of, of different actors. Um, so who was actually tweeting the riots? Um, and from a communication point of view, <coughs> understanding the role of quote-unquote opinion leaders is really important. So from the point of the message leaving you know, on the platform, who are the, who are the key people who then fan out, who then further dissemin disseminate that information? And we were really interested in finding out who those people were. So in terms of what The Guardian had done, and I'm really sorry I'm sort of showing you on this rubbish small screen, is they had looked at this um, corpus of 2.6 million tweets to see which hashtags had become important at what time. And what you see, and I'll click through it really um, quickly, is that the uh, riot cleanup hashtag became the kind of huge peak in activity was seen by around 7 uh, million people. So in terms of how Twitter was used, it was quite clear from just this very basic analysis that people did use it to organize, but for um, purposes of, of cleaning, cleaning up. Um, and, and most of you will be familiar with um, Dan Thompson's riot cleanup account. Now, what we um, looked at specifically was the role of seven different rumors. Um, and you may remember these from the time. So um, apparently tigers had been let loose um, and were roaming Primrose Hill. People were frying their own food in McDonald's. Um, the riots, uh, one of the catalysts outside of the killing of Mark Duggan was the beating up of a 16-year-old girl in Tottenham. That was one of the rumours. The London Eye had been set on fire and apparently had been pushed over by rioters. Uh, Birmingham Children's Hospital had been, uh, was under attack by rioters. Uh, tanks had rolled into bank, uh, and Miss Selfridge in uh, Manchester was, um, set, had been set on fire. So what we have is a mix of different kinds of uh, information flows that at the time were either discredited very quickly, um, or were very quickly shown to be true, or were sort of left unanswered. So we never really found out what happened with um, people frying their own food at McDonald's, for example. Um, but one of the things that became really clear to me from, from um, listening to a lot of people today is that what we looked at is very big rumours, right? So the ones that really floated to the top. But one of the things that I think is really important also is all of these much smaller local rumours that are only being discussed by maybe 5, 10, 20 people that may actually have a very serious and pernicious impact in a local situation for a local police force. So, um, if you go on the Reading the Riots project side, what you will see is one of these visualizations where you can actually see how these rumors played out. And this is one of the things that um, I'm keenly interested in as someone who does crisis communication. So what we coded up is what type of information does the tweet contain, right? So when you're interested in how do people deal with information, it's really interesting to know whether or not they're simply reproducing the rumor, right? whether or not they are questioning it, whether or not they're providing evidence that counters the rumor, or they're commenting on information about the rumor. So what the visualization shows, and this is about the Birmingham Children's Hospital, is that in the first, <coughs> this is a rumor that plays out over 12 hours. So the temporality is also really important. How long do these rumors stay alive, right? So we looked at the life cycle of these. And if you look at the Birmingham Children's Hospital, the claim was that rioters had sort of broken in and were starting to sort of smash up the place. And what you see is that there's a lot of repetition early on, if you, I can just click through it, of the rumor simply reproducing itself and, and growing, actually. So all the green 
is that claim, that unsubstantiated claim, being reproduced. I'm oh, sorry, I can throw it a little bit bigger. Luckily, they're sort of like green and red is easy to identify. The red shows where people are questioning it and are actually saying, no, this isn't happening. Right? So what you see over a time period is that the red becomes more dominant and people actually weighing in and saying, no, local police and the local media are reporting that this isn't true um, and this is not happening. The other thing that we see in this rumor is that people are countering it using logic. So we have um, Andy Maybert here today with us who played a really key role in actually saying it's not happening because the hospital is opposite the police station. If you just take a step back and think about whether or not this is likely to be happening, we can deduce using logic that it's not happening. And so what this showed for me as a, a media scholar is not only the role of uh, local uh, emergency services, not just the role of local um, journalists, but very much the role of individual Twitter users who have enough clout to actually go into a situation like that and calm the situation down and say it's not happening. And so that tweet um, really played a very significant role in, in diffusing that situation. But one of the things that's very interesting also is that slowly the red and the green start to disappear and the green gets bigger again. And that's the end of, of that. But <coughs> what, is, what is interesting about this, because it plays out over a longer period of time, is that Twitter is not <coughs> like television. Twitter is not, like, it's not something where people watch, they get the information, and it's sort of on repeat. People can come in later and think, oh, the Birmingham Children's Hospital, something's happening, quick, retweet. And one of the things that um, we saw, and we saw this with a lot of rumors, is that they don't die out in one go. You have to kind of keep going at them to make sure that that information gets distributed and cascades down into all the relevant networks. And this is the thing that when you hear that, it's com it makes complete sense. Of course, we don't all see the same thing on Twitter. But as a media scholar, it took visualizing it like this, for me to go, ah, right, this is really important. It's really important for emergency services to realize, for local journalists to realize, you have to repeat the message. You have to, in, in, in set time intervals, you have to basically say, that thing you heard, it's not true. That thing you heard, it's not true. That thing you heard, it's not true. Because if you say it once or twice early on and you think you've done enough of your job to, de to debunk it, what we've seen time and time again across these rumors is that's not enough. So they are debunked, but then new people log on to Twitter in a disconnected network, hear something, oh my god, tigers are roaming, we're loose, and it starts to repeat itself again. So I think because um, I, I seem to be doing far too much talking already, um, one of the things I really want to ask you and open up for debate is in terms of this research on rumors, um, what has your experience during the riots or just in general in, in dealing with kind of misinformation, um, does, this, does this kind of sound familiar? Because one, one of the things that I'm very aware of is that what we've looked at is the ones that broke and made it, you know, floated to the surface, which tend to be either ludicrous or really large, but not necessarily, um, you know, at a sort of more local local level. So, I guess, you know, I want to sort of open it up now because this is very, this has to very much be um, a dialogue. I mean, does, does does this come as a surprise to to the people who are dealing with this within within the emergency services they are in, or within the kind of comms departments that you're in? No, it's, and it's nice that it's been recognised by someone who doesn't necessarily do the same job as us and is coming at it from a different perspective mm. because we deal with this on a small level on a daily basis. Yeah. And, and how do you deal with it then? I mean, how would you have, I mean, how, I guess my question is how do you use social media or how have you been using social media to deal with rumours or to deal with misinformation? Because this seems to be, for me, one of the themes that really keeps coming up um, and in large events 
you know, misinformation spreading very quickly, you know, can have a detrimental effect. So how, how do you deal with it on a daily basis? I think it's, you, you, you've encapsulated it by saying you have to go back and ensure that rumour isn't resurfacing because in what you said is it, absolutely bang on about how it surfaced once, you might answer it with the facts once, mm. but then later users coming back and recycling the same messaging, reinvigorating misinformation later on, and it's, it's about constant monitoring and, mm. and permanent troubleshooting across a period of hours and sometimes days to, to make sure you put accurate information into wherever misinformation is cropping up. Yeah. More of a, a comment, really. The, mm. the, I think the the rumours may keep on popping back up again, mm -hmm. but if the statement saying it's not true, if that can be accompanied by footage of some type yeah. showing, you know, date and time stamped, yeah. here is the yeah. hospital, it's fine, yeah. here is the zoo, all the tigers are in behind the bars yeah. or, or whatever, yeah. um, then that, that's more likely to sort of kind of scotch. I think that's a really good point, and I should have said a little bit more about that that where um, information is discredited is most powerful if it has you know, that kind of evidence and that that kind of evidence can be repeated. Um, and, and, and as you say, that that is really what then quite powerfully um, often ends up debunking it. There was a question. Well, well this reminds me of this research that I came across years ago uh, from the Iroquois uh, in uh, Canada back in the 19th century where they, there was a, fire, a small fire on the stage um, the whole audience panicked, um, and a lot of people were killed in the crush. Um, and a lot of a lot of research into then why did that happen? And we still see evidence of what hap of of that research whenever we go to the theatre, because what we see is the safety curtain comes down, and that's to dampen down people's panic if something should happen on on the stage. So they don't physically they don't because we know that a fire is often spread from the stage oh, okay. into yeah. the auditorium. Yeah. Because what they reasoned was is that people in the auditorium, in the audience, had a choice. Do I panic and go and buy petrol now, mm. or do I not panic, but then fear that the petrol stations will run out of petrol and I want to fill up my car tomorrow? And unless they're sure that everyone's not going to panic, then they panic, because that's the best choice to make in that circumstance. Mm. So a lot of stuff that goes on, you know, we, we see fire escapes, we see safety curtains, are all designed to say, don't panic. You don't need to panic because nobody else is panicking. So if we all walk out quietly, we'll all get out and everything's fine. Because mm -hmm. uh, we all don't now go and buy petrol, we'll all be okay. Mm -hmm. So I think what for me is interesting is how riots, in a sense, fostered people perhaps reacting in ways that they wouldn't ordinarily react. And what surprises me is that the research into the writing has included more psychologists looking at mass behavior um, and what are the factors that un underpin that. There are, there are people, there are people, um, yeah, there are people yeah. involved doing that as well. There was a question. So I think the whole idea of contagion, yeah. I think, and how Twitter says fosters contagion. So yeah, I mean, if you start to talk about things like contagion, you end up in epidemiology very quickly, and that's yeah. very, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Both. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. both. Right. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Um, one of the most interesting examples I saw from the riots mm. was when there was a story circulating that Warsaw Police Station was on fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the local officers took a picture of it and said, look at the station, look how not on fire it is. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it speaks a thousand words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I suppose it's, it's all the Hampton experience, which, which I picked up, because I'm from Warsaw, mm. I work for Warsaw Council, mm. and uh, I was blissfully in ignorance on holiday, so I missed all of this. Mm. Uh, but afterwards, um, I was really impressed with, with two things, uh, which we had connected. Uh, there's a, a superintendent in Wolverhampton called Superintendent Mark Payne, yeah. who's worked very closely with, with WV11, which is a yeah. blog in, in the area. Mm. And the, the, the bloggers would spot a rumour, go straight to Mark Payne, and he would shoot them down, uh, would go away and mm. research them, then shoot them down very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I was at a session recently where, where Seth Jennings from WV11 mm. sort of presented the sorts of um, uh, statistics that she had and her experience of it. Mm. Um, I think from memory, I'll, I'll double check it. It was something ridiculous like 700,000 Facebook impressions on, 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 really? on WV11. Okay. Um, just, just in a really short space of time. One, one of the things that, that we learned from it, you know, Warsaw Council, Wolverhampton Council, the police, mm. and also the bloggers were, we mm. reached the conclusion that, that 
when an incident happened, which was police led or fire led, mm. then the council would retweet, the other two people would retweet it really, really quickly. Yeah. Because well, the feedback from the bloggers was, was that, yes, but the council wasn't saying anything. It didn't matter that the council weren't responsible for that thing. They just wanted the message to be retweeted. Mm. Um, and just on a very low level um, way, there was, a, there, was, there, was, there was quite a serious flooding incident in, in Warsaw. Mm. Um, and we very quickly just retweeted stuff straight away from the police and uh, the fire on the ground. That seemed to sort of work from the point of view of um, you know, the wild rumours weren't running out of control because there was already an yeah. or authoritative voice who'd been amplified several times. Yeah, I think the authoritative voice is a really important one and, and what I'm increasingly interested in is different models that can help you to have that. And I think one is for those services to debunk these rumours directly. But I think one of the things the riot showed is you can't be everywhere at the same time and it's really difficult to, to know where to send people, right? So if you have all these kind of pockets of rumors and you know things that are, are supposed to be happening, how do you operationally decide, okay, we'll, we'll definitely send people there, but not there? So one of the things that is happening a lot in the Middle East now and reporting uh, by people like Andy Carvin is that he has built this very large network of trusted sources and he trains his sources to understand how to verify and how to question information and, and influence their, their tweeting behavior. For example, really simple things that, that um, we can try and engage the community in more is don't blindly retweet something. If you don't know whether it's true or not, think of the consequences of retweeting that. So if you don't know that it's true, maybe you can, can hashtag it, you know, heard this rumor unconfirmed. I mean, I know that I'm talking about an ideal world here and this is not how people behave, but I do think that it's worth thinking about, particularly in an in a, a, a economy where everything is being cut and services are being cut, how we can engage the community, not simply by saying, you know, this is what we're doing and, you know, I want you to know about the police and I want you to know about um, what we're doing in your neighborhood, but act actively involve people that when things happen, you have more eyes on the ground and you have people who could actually have that voice of authority in the same way that Andy had that voice of authority through being a trusted person on Twitter. So I was in a session before where trust is a really big issue, but individual Twitter users can have that, that trust level. They can have that credibility. And I think that's where some of these models can go where you could engage with those people more so your cascade can become much wider than simply saying, okay, let's get a retweet from the council, let's get a retweet from this, but you actually try and engage with more people and, and so on. So one of the things that we, um, we found is this kind of curating of information. So one of the things I would really be interested to, to hear about is is, is is this happening in as far as you know, in the sort of Twitter engagement, is, is how good are you, for example, at making lists and then pointing people at lists saying these are all trusted sources. Because this is one of the things that really happened during the riots, that people started curating lists very fast. This is again Andy Corbin doing this also in the Middle East. Making lists and simply being able to point people at, well, at least we know all these people in this room can be trusted. So if they say something, Right? Phil, Phil did that really well. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. That was that was that was going to be my example. He did that really well, and and he's actually uh, now a recognised UK Twitterati. So, um, yeah. So 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 you. I think what we what we saw on the right is a number of kind of behaviours that can be really effective, and and curating information and producing lists, which Twitter now allows you to do, is really useful. Yeah. yeah I'm glad you mentioned curation because mm. actually, just imagine, you know, wait, there's a rumour going around and people are out there squashing it. Maybe celebrities are joining in as well. They're actually curating that and put it onto a Storify yeah. and say, actually, look at all these people. Yeah. Here it is. Put it on your website and better. Tweet it out and say, actually, these people are saying this rumor is rubbish. Either way, it yeah. help. It's not going to cure the rumor, but actually bringing it all together to build up a credible case. It's almost like a court case. Yeah. These are our witnesses. Yeah. This rumor is false. Here they are, either in Storify, and again, you are list there. Uh, yeah. By Twitter. 
But if you, I mean, if you don't mind, and if you're interested in, in, in the role that some of the kind of celebrities in Twitterati play, then I'm very happy to kind of share that part of the, the research with you. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with uh, sort of the media communication uh, theories here, but one of the key theories that is interesting here is the two-step flow model of communication, which, which fundamentally relies on opinion leaders which fundamentally relies on information going step one, step two is the opinion leader, and then out. And it's those opinion leaders that in crisis moments are absolutely crucial. So your field producer, for example. Yeah, so um, I know we were in the session earlier mm. this morning, and mm. I mentioned that Cumbria police <coughs> yeah. have, I think, done or gone yeah. steps in the right direction of what you're saying. Okay. So um, they did a research, and they got an external company to tell them in each um, north, south, east, west part of the county, who were the most sort of avid and most um, okay. sort of a bit like leaders yeah. on Twitter. So I was I was one of the people who was asked to come in. It was a group of about 20 of us, and they were asking. They were showing us what they've been doing on Twitter mm. and what their analytics of you know of the effectiveness of what they've been doing, mm. the type mm. of messages they've been putting out. And they asked us for their for our advice as other people who were using social media mm. very actively of how they could use it better. Well, that's really forward thinking and, and recognising that. Yeah. And, all, and they did it with the county council. So it was a county mm. council and police event. Mm. Um, and it was just on an evening. They, it was like very informal. And they were also asking about if you know how we could you know what we could suggest in terms of what they could what the, what we would want from the police. Yeah. Um, and so we mentioned about the fact that we might want the messages split up so the, the chitter chatter to be one, you know, one stream, yeah. the marketing <coughs> and the sort of PR to be another, another stream, and the emergency messages to be another stream for them completely. So yeah. I know that they've been doing some work and some really, you know, some really good work in terms of using social media. Well, that's a really that's a really good point because one of the things I think is often a misconception about Twitter is that it's just one kind of communication taking place and it's really multiple models of communication taking place so broadcasting uh, just one-to-one -one, uh, many to many it's lots of different things are happening and and I think and in terms of yeah and I think in terms of crisis communication or even everyday um, engagement it's really useful to say okay well who's going to take care of just the broadcasting side literally just sending out messages we have this event or here are some statistics just kind of on the information level Who's comfortable and happy to do the engagement, have a personality, chat to people? And the thing is, it's also making the most of individual strengths. Some people are really chatty and are willing to, to play that role. Some people are really happy crunching numbers and, and, and sending out the stats, right? And both are really important. <coughs> then there's other people, again, who might be really good on Twitter and, and tracking rumors or tracking misinformation, or tracking anything that, that, that spikes and that needs immediate attention because they're kind of Twitter junkies and they're on there a lot, right? And I think where we're headed now is the recognition that you need to divide these different modes of communication and you, you, you shouldn't try and do everything with one account or even with one person. Can I just go back to your influence and some of what we've done? Um, the whole kind of uh, one-size-fits-all approach you can't do. Prior, if you've got a, a planned event coming up, you can do a lot of work prior to the event in identifying key influencers. Mm. You can't take your eye off that ball because actually what we found is that people will pop up out of nowhere yeah. and because of the situation or their location or the fact that they're using a lot of pictures or whatever, they will become an influencer out of nowhere. Yeah. I do, do people mind if I just tell you what we found in, in specifically in relation to that? So I'll, I'll just um, quickly um, tell you that we looked at the top 1,000 most mentioned accounts. So we had 700,000 individual accounts, but we looked at the top 1,000 and who was in them and um, how can we categorize them. So what I did is I looked at uh, building a typology of 20 actor types. 20 different categories for these different actors. Um, and so what we, what we found is what is really important is the Twitterati. The UK Twitterati ended up playing a really uh, quite crucial role in this. What the other thing we found is you have to really take into account this kind of curating, accounts that are set up to deal with the riot. So I named those riot accounts. And in those riot accounts, you had different things. You had the right cleanup, you had shop a looter, 
you had these lists, curating information. Um, we had um, accounts that were spoof accounts. So uh, we had people like Lord Voldemort um, tweeting the riots, um, <laughs> which I will talk about a little bit. But this, this bar chart basically shows you the result of coding the top 200 accounts. And what you see is, I mean, hopefully all of you can see that there's sort of taller bars closer to my hand. Um, is that the mainstream media is dominant? The mainstream media was overwhelmingly dominant. It was nearly uh, half of all the time mentioned in this top 200 accounts was mainstream media, mainstream media journalists. So in terms of the role of the mainstream media, it plays an enormously important role in social media. And they take a very much a broadcasting um, kind of approach. Um, so that was really, that was a really important finding. The other important finding is that there was a lot of members of the public in there. And these were, the, these were these users that rose to prominence out of nowhere. So the Dan Thompsons, who set up the Riot Cleanup account, the person who uh, tweeted the, the Broom Army photograph, um, and people like that. Um, emergency services didn't do terribly well. Um, they really uh, didn't feature uh, much at all. Um, and this is one of the things that, that we're looking at. So, I mean, this Broom Army um, image had 400,000 views in about four hours. And the reason this happened, the reason this went viral, is because <coughs> this was just an ordinary, ordinary member of the public who understood how Twitter worked and at replied that image to Piers Morgan, John Prescott, and some other people, and it just, it just, went, it just went from there. So understanding um, the platform. In terms of the top ten, the most mentioned account was the Riot Cleanup account, which doesn't really come as a surprise. Lots of journalists in there. But the Greater Manchester Police was number ten of most mentioned accounts during that whole four-day period. And I think this is sort of what we're building on. Um, how can more be made um, of the use of social media um, in, in that sense? So in terms of the spoof accounts, in the top 25, we had Lord Voldemort, we had Professor Snape, and we had the Queen, the fake Queen mm -hmm. on Twitter. And so one of the things that I think people often miss when they talk about Twitter, is that Twitter is, uh, has a, a fabric, a social fabric of its own, and spoof accounts and humor play a large part in that. And so it's really unsurprising to find these kinds of, of accounts in there. Uh, in Manchester, we had people planking the riots. So there was an image that went viral of people um, lying flat as a plank in front of evidence, in front of riot police. Um, there was a lot of social commentary around the use of technology by the police, by the media. Uh, saying things, well, you can't get into BlackBerry Messenger, why don't you ask News International? You know, they seem to be very good at it. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of kind of commentary. And so where we're taking this next is that what is really, really important is context. How are these accounts being engaged with? And for me, one of the, thing, the things I'm really interested in is scale. So if you end up in the top 1,000, okay, sure, that's one thing, that's a national level. But what about the smaller accounts that didn't make the list, that really had a very significant impact locally, uh, journalists, emergency services, and so on. So what I'm slightly worried about with this increased um, kind of production of lists, produ production of, of influence lists, so, you know, Twitterati lists, but increasingly the independent is also making influence lists about ordinary users. In this tentative moment when emergency services are really trying out, you know, and, and doing social media, and some are doing it extremely well, what is this kind of performative element going to do to that when you, are, you don't end up on these lists? What if you're not in the top 1,000? We had a journalist, a local journalist, who was really angry with us because he said he'd done a really, really good job, but he wasn't on the top 1,000. So I think I want to really throw that open and, and ask you, in terms of this kind of moment, what, what this might do to, you know, doing social media in the emergency services. Is this something that you would be worried about, whether or not you make a list, whether or not this now becomes part of your kind of, you know, performance, um, you know, measure, for example? Because it will be for me. I mean, I'm a social media researcher. If my cloud score isn't, you know, X at some point, they'll just say, well, you say you have an influence on Twitter, but we beg to differ because... And that worries me, actually. That worries me that we're moving towards metrics, measurements, 
something that you know is tangible, whereas you know quality may not be measured. Uh, and I think it's much more about the quality of the engagement rather than being able to point at figures. Yeah, I was your um, um, segmentation, what your marketing strategy is. Mm. You know, the way I would describe things like climate is that you know, when you get to the door of the aircraft, you want to turn left to the nice seats or right to the crummy seats, and you want to talk to the people in the left-hand seats or the right seats. And it may be for that particular initiative or that particular thing, you want to talk to the people in the left-hand seats. Mm. So you know, there isn't a right or wrong. It's no, just I agree. No, no, I, absolutely. I, I don't think that there is a right or wrong, but I, I think increasingly what will be easier to measure will become dominant in... in, in judging performance, that's what I'm getting at. That's what I, I think, because doing something qualitatively is much harder. Whilst they're getting better as well, tools like Clout and Cred and mm. Peer Index, mm. they are brand new tools by brand new companies in a mm. brand new market, and they don't do things like sentiment or language or sarcasm uh, very well, so sometimes it's hard to use them for qualitative data in a, in a city like London where there's 150 languages. Or mm. And how's Cloud going to deal with that? Not well, I would imagine. No. no. There's also an issue that um, these tweets are about using um, that sort of sentiment side of things. Um, we did a review of a load of tweets that we'd sent out that we were really proud of. They were really good news. Uh, but of course they mentioned burglary or they mentioned, you know, we caught a burglar. The fact they mentioned a burglar means that's a very negative tweet in the eye of these kind of uh, sentiment things. And they were very sure that it was a negative tweet with sort of 97% uh, confidence in the thing. So it's a, it's a big issue. I think you can retrain them, but yeah. The issue about sentiment analysis, which is really interesting, because we did sentiment analysis on the right corpus as well, is that I think it's a lot to do with the imagination of what these tools might tell you. So a lot of people would like to be able to feed data into a supercomputer and for the supercomputer to tell you like in nice little chunks what it all means, and it doesn't work like that at all. Um, and sentiment analysis is really, really difficult. Um, and if I gave you all the same hundred tweets, you would all say different things about the sentiment in those tweets, because that's how language works. Yet we somehow trust these tools, and, and, and by approximation, what these tools can do is, is only get close to human coding levels. But human coding levels are rubbish. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that people don't understand, that actually to read from 140 characters what someone's sentiment is, is really hard. Because we don't go and ask them. We don't go and ask them, what did you mean? Is that negative to you? Is that positive? And so I think that's, that's really complicated and really, um, and really difficult. And I think also the point about the burglary is really interesting that maybe from the position of the police, it's, it's a very positive thing to be open and transparent. But what are you open and transparent about? Burglaries. It's something that by just using that word, it's like, well, we don't want to hear about that, or that, you know, so I think that's really, that's really interesting, because, I mean, of course, the larger environment is one of transparency, where you have to, <coughs> you know. This is why it's, it's important to not just trust one way of doing it. No. So, yeah. use people, use people of different um, cultures, mm. mindsets, sense of humour, use machine tools, but don't just rely on one, use a whole mm. bunch of them, mm -hmm. and that way you can take a view and reduce the risk of having misinterpreted it. But that's very time um, costly, though. Mm. I mean, so that, that I think that's, you know, we're getting at something I think really interesting that in order to deal with the issues that you're raising and, and you know, issues around sentiment analysis and, and what you're saying, to do that well, doing kind of this qualitative stuff, who's going to do it? Who's got time in their workflow to do that? Is this where there could be more on the way of crowdsourcing that? You know, we have millions of people across the world, mm -hmm. millions of brains, people with their own computers, whether it's handheld, desktop, etc. Mm -hmm. Then there's a lot of goodwill out there. Yeah. Like I mean, how would people feel about their police accounts being kind of analysed by, you know, crowdsourced intelligence? It's all open data, so... Yeah. It's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. Not per se. I mean, the thing about open data is, is, you know, it's only certain data sets that actually get looked at. And yeah, that people actually... You, you have to go with the assumption that it's yeah. anyway. That's what I'm yeah. going to say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. If it's information you've made public anyway, mm -hmm. you've got nothing to hide, and it's an honest and truthful feedback from the people you're meant to be serving, influencing, and working with. So mm. I don't see any harm. Mm. So. I think one of the things that I was really curious about when I found out about this event, because we're now in this sort of phase of trying to figure out how any of this analysis might be helpful to people who are working in these services. I mean, what could I do for you, basically, is my question. So I, I'm an academic, so I do this work, I've done this analysis, but now we're getting to the stage of how can we implement this and how can it be made useful and that's I think the crucial thing for me. How can this be useful? How can I be useful to you? Do you have your hand up? Well I guess two things occur. One is could Twitter provide some sort of early warning system? Like it, like we hope one day we'll have for earthquakes. Is there some way in which it could be spotted? Um, so that the resources could be allocated and deployed in a way that would be preventative and would keep a lid on things the way that didn't happen um, last year. Um, and I guess the other element of it would be perhaps what can be done within Twitter to go even further back and prevent and deal with the conditions that fostered it in the first place, um, whatever those are. And it's diverse and it's complex and David Lammy's book is a great exposition of it and some of the other reports that have come out since as well. So I guess that's for me what would be interesting. Um, and uh, I guess thirdly, in the end, is what, what's the implications for the blue light services if it does go off again on a hot Saturday evening sometime in August um, this year, which is when typically these things yeah. tend to start. Yeah. No, I, think, I, mean, I think the early warning system is one that you know, repeatedly comes up. And data miner, if you have a look at um, data miner, um, they've just made a deal with Twitter and that's exactly what they're building, but it's corporate and it will be for corporate clients. So who will end up buying that? Um, it's people with money, but early warning systems is, is you know, all the rage now. Um, so, sorry, somebody's yeah. already mentioned it, but yeah. Twitter can help as well, especially mm -hmm. through this. They should actually give a free promote tweet actually during a crisis. Pro Twitter should yeah, sell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As their part of their social responsibility okay, to help in a crisis. They actually know Coca-Cola, you're not having today's promoted tweet. We are. It's a big crisis. That's We're going to promote this. Yeah. And actually, and they should yeah. be doing that. Does Twitter have a CSR program, then? Uh, Twitter's been working quite closely with um, Nick Keane. I mean, during, certainly during yeah. the riots, they were, uh, they were approaching us. Twitter approached Surrey Police and all the other police forces mm -hmm. to say, can we verify you at least you know, it's a start. So mm -hmm. they, they certainly care about it. And as I say, Nick Keane's been doing some great work kind of getting in with them and, and talking to them. But quite how much they have a sort of formal CSL program, I don't know. is one of the sort of product sponsors but we do have a system built at the Environment Agency which is to kind of try and spot high of the trends so in an area for like the phrase is flooding we, we measure over 24 hour period before and what, we, is that, what is that program for? It's um, a crowd control so we set a sensitivity to that so then if it starts to trend or starts being discussed above the average then that's alerted so that's part of when I'm speaking to police also saying that you could set that for disorders, riots, problem, um, if there's problem crime spots in areas, you can set that as a early warning. Do you do that for like um, flu? Okay, well, flu trends, yeah. So any other um, questions? For um, early identification of epidemics, that sort of thing, yeah. as well as that sort of thing. Yeah. Can I ask a question yeah. of how you would, what sort of trends you would use? to um, predict social unrest, given that the analysis seems to show that social unrest wasn't organised on Twitter. No, I think that's a really good point. I think that's a really, really, really good point, actually, because what one of the key things the riots showed is time and time again, people are terrible at <coughs> predicting the technology people end up using. They were terrible at predicting that BlackBerry Messenger was going to be the key, the key platform or it's going to be the key technology. Um, my early work on, on crisis communication and social media looked at Hurricane Katrina. At that point, the breaking news platform, um, and I'll give you uh, some sort of small prize if you can guess what the breaking news platform was in 2005. It's Wikipedia. 
and and the and and so these are things that people don't necessarily are good at predicting. Where is the large volume of people collaborating on news and so on? And so Wiki Foundation, of course, had Wiki News, but nobody was using Wiki News. I mean, I did a study on Wiki News, looking at Hurricane Katrina, and it just didn't work. But the the community of Wikipedians on Wikipedia managed to mobilize that community very quickly, and they did the same during Virginia Tech uh, High School Massacre in 2007. And so this is, this is, I think, what we need to get better at. It's not simply early warning systems. It's early warning systems on which platforms. So it's early warning systems in a communication media ecology. It's not about early warning systems on Twitter, because Twitter is going to go the way of MySpace. But at least there would be, you could see where the mood is darkening. Yes. You know, so there are a bunch of platforms that will come and go and, yeah. and the like. Yeah. But as long as they're going, yeah. if, if the language being used is getting more and more and more and more negative, then at least yeah. there's that identification of where the, where might there be trouble. Yeah. And an assessment within the area, you know, it, 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 it depends on languages and cultures and all sorts of different um, factors, probably local, as mm -hmm. to what do people around here use. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, but I think that's crucial. I think that's really, really crucial to understand in the community we are part of, what do people tend to use? That would already be a massive um, step forward because I think people are on Facebook much more than they're on Twitter. And, and you, it's very difficult to get at that. Um, and now I know that there is, um, from an MPIA perspective, uh, an ACPO perspective, much more um, a drive to go onto Google Plus um, and to sort of you know see where, where that might go. So I think that's really, really interesting, but I think um, you mentioned the, f the Google flu trends. Search is a really interesting thing to look at. What are people searching for? Because often that tells you a lot. It can tell you a lot about what's happening in your location because people are, are asking things, you know, are there, are there these things happening? Um, or they're, they're searching for particular items. So Google flu trends works because people are searching for particular items to buy or they're asking, so for example, Tammy flu, you know, where, where do I get Tammy flu? Oh, a, spe a, a, a spike. And then three days later, flu, you know, hits. So I think it's, it's multiple platforms and multiple kind of uh, understandings of communication and how people use communication. Because more people, everyone uses Google, not everyone uses Twitter. But on the other hand, the key sources that you're going to get for those sorts of messages are things like BBM and text messages, yeah. which are not searchable. No. No. No, so I think one of the things that comes back to, and it's been said on a number of sessions, is trust. Trusted sources. Um, if, you, if you come across in your network uh, and there is a BBM message floating about, do you have, is there someone you can confidentially speak to? Do you feel that you have that trust in your local police officer? So I think, again, it, it boils down to, you know, um, engagement with the local community a lot. May that engagement be, you know, through social media, through more traditional means, um, and so on. So, but, so for me, some of the key themes that, that seem to come out of this a lot are trust, early warning systems, um, understanding how to respond in terms of rumors, understanding your community, um, and so on, and these kind of different measures through which you, you deal you deal with this information. I was, when the rights ran, I was at a funeral mm. in Birmingham, and I was traveling back, and I got a phone call from my 14-year-old son, who said, Dad, I've just had a BBM message, I live in Huddersfield, yeah? I've just had a BBM message saying there's going to be a riot in Huddersfield, oh, what shall I do about it? And I said, well, ignore it. But this is something I should have done. Mm. Yeah, I mm. think, you know, but by that time it was several days after Tottenham and, you know, these things were circulating all the time. And me saying something publicly about that probably, I don't know if it would have done any good. But, mm. you know, should, if we, if we hit, get these things from our children or whatever, yeah. should we do something about it? Yeah. There is a question, if you're looking at it from an intelligence officer's point of view, if you get a single tweet or a single BBM message, mm. um, so police people within the room will be aware of the 5 by 5 by 5 system. How do you uh, describe that as a piece of intelligence? Because it's one piece of intelligence. And, okay, if you've then got a volume of stuff coming in, then you've got multiple pieces of intelligence. But actually, I'm not sure that the intelligence systems and how we categorize intelligence are set up for that sort of community intelligence. Um, I don't have an answer, but it's a, a problem. <laughs> and so I guess... When you're saying, what can you do with this corpus? What can you do to help 
this community, the, yeah. the uh, emergency services, actually kind of, if you've got any thinking around how do we kind of categorize, deal with that sort of stuff, that would be really helpful. Are there any, any other suggestions about how, how work like this could help the work that you do on a daily basis? I think they're really useful if it's published and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we put things online a bit later on. I, I've put um, earlier slides, so on the hashtag I've put um, some earlier slides and also a blog post that I wrote about who right. tweets at the rights and I, I intend to kind of do more of that. Yeah. So just basically keep sharing the information. Yeah, that's really yeah. useful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, um, that's been a really, really useful discussion for me. Um, I'm Fly Girl too on Twitter. So if you later on decide you have other questions or you want more information or you want to, you know, meet at some point or whatever, um, you know, please, um, I'm very accessible on Twitter. Do get in touch um, because for me, doing the research is one thing and it's really interesting, but actually seeing it go out there and be useful is, is you know, is much more important.